Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. I think the first thing to notice in this passage is the striking contrast. On the one hand, you have a great multitude, and on the other hand, you have one lowly individual. I suggest as low on the social scale as you can possibly get, a blind beggar. It is tremendously impressive to see Jesus turn his attention from the many to the one. No crowd was ever large enough to blind him or render him deaf. His was not only an amazingly sensitive ear and eye, there is evidence of something much deeper. The priority he gave to persons, to any person at that point of need. On Jesus' agenda, one beggar, single-handed, could put a thousand to flight. This, I believe, sounds all quite different from the distorted vision we so easily fall into. We like the crowd. I'm sorry, I'm on my way to speak at the convention. There will be a crowd there. See you later, perhaps. This brief, dramatic narrative I believe comes with great pertinence to a generation which thinks and acts largely in terms of multitudes and quantities. Just think, more and more we seem inclined to settle all questions by some kind of mass opinion poll. The individual easily gets lost, particularly when they sit as Bartimaeus did on the lowest rung of the social ladder. Consequently, the valuation that Jesus set on one person in need is itself one of the greatest needs of our time. I believe all the more because so many live in overcrowded towns and cities that seem to multiply the number of sick, the lonely, the destitute, and increase the intensity of their wretchedness. No wonder that mental health problems and instability have enormously increased. Society and the church need desperately to keep a keen eye to see beyond the multitude and a honed ear that can hear above the roar of the crowd, to hear the cry from the roadside, have mercy on me. But to us, his disciples, this picture of Jesus comes with, I believe, a special compulsion. The one can be lost in the many, just as readily when we talk of a congregation as when the talk is of a crowd on the street. We can be blind in the pew, and we can be deaf in front of the altar. And no creed, no liturgy, no hymn, and no prayer can absolve the dim eye or the dull ear. When Bartimaeus shouts to Jesus, have mercy on me, son of David, we can vividly picture the excitement and movement of the milling crowd. They were disturbed by the agitated cries of the blind beggar, the rebuke that many hurled at him, Jesus stopping, the blind man springing to his feet and throwing off his cloak, all of this gives an impression not of still life, but of swift action. In the incessant cries of Bartimaeus, we could hear a man saying over and over to my, himself, here is my chance. Of course nothing could stop him. He was jumping at a chance of a lifetime. I expect it was probably more a venture of desperation more of wild hope than of any considered faith, 
but it was hope acted upon. Jesus is here. Perhaps he will. Perhaps. That leap of hope has been an endlessly repeated act in Christian history. The rumour of a healer, of one who could lift life out of its defeats, has come to people even when they could not see Jesus clearly. And they have made the venture, and they have brought their lives to him. Sometimes the venture has been at the point of desperation. More often, at the beginning of life, as a sense of dependence and a need for guidance. Always this central drama of salvation for individual lives has gone on. The wistful hope that Jesus might be the answer. The venture of bringing life to them. The saving force. Your faith has made you well. Or as the hymn writer William T. Sleeper put it, out of my sickness into your health, out of my want and into your wealth. The note of rebuke administered to the people that came to Jesus runs through Mark like a theme in a musical fugue. Here the rebuke comes from the crowd and not from the disciples. I believe that a stock answer to the crowds in history, to all those who made a noise about the need and suffering, has been just the same. Get out, keep quiet, and be still. It was a callous thing to do, but as we know, crowds with their swift intolerance, their undisciplined emotions, can do heartless and cruel things. The interruption annoyed them. After all, they were interested in Jesus. That was the big excitement, the focus of their attention. To them, this beggar was unimportant. His eager pushing of his insignificant self into the centre of the stage was a nuisance, and they met it with indifference and the command to be quiet. And their rebuke has echoed through the ages, we can even hear it now without listening too intently. The crowd at Jericho chided the beggar for bringing his troubles to Jesus. To their massive ignorance, such things as poverty and affliction had nothing to do with the master. I can assure you that even in our towns and cities today, there are crowds who utter the same rebuff. When poverty stalks the land, when unemployment goes up and human life goes down and people cry out. These are religious problems. It is the responsibility of the Church of Christ to do something about them. But the swift rebuke still comes. Be quiet. There is no use in crying to Jesus. Poverty and need are not his business. Let the Church keep out of economic questions. Keep still. The complete answer to that is indeed what Jesus did. He stopped and he said, call him. Jesus demonstrated that all human need is his business. And please remember, it still is. What does our whole manner say most about us? Are we like the crowd and say, keep still? Or like Jesus and say, come? In verse 49 we read this. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. There is an everlasting eloquence in the verb stopped. Here Jesus pays ultimate tribute to a person in need. He stops the parade and he stands to attention before him. Here, I believe, he gives a dramatic representation to what is often a very woolly phrase, the sacredness of personality. Jesus did not use this phrase. He did not need to. He lived it. He stopped and gave the whole of his attention, his mind and heart, to a blind beggar. 
His stopping said clearly, you count. I believe that this is one of the deep, paramount needs of humanity. The need of respect, the assurance that one counts, that he is not merely an item in some total. But the art of stopping is a high art. We are all so busy and have full schedules. It seems that we arrive breathless, just in time for our next appointment. It is not easy to stop. It takes humility. It takes reverence for personality. I believe that this narrative reminds us that it is a necessary prelude to any real work of healing. Jesus never healed anyone on the run. Stopping is a necessary part of any genuine ministry to life. The disciple is not above his master. He or she must learn to stand at attention before his brother or sister in Christ. The giving of recognition and respect as to one who counts is a basic social service. In itself, it hands out no bread. It doesn't give a job. And it will not solve intricate problems of social adjustment. But it meets a fundamental need which underlies all social problems. Many of the ills of the social body come from the lack of it, so keenly felt in herding, in segregation and discrimination, in the stubborn insistence of lumping people as a class and not as individuals of particular quality. The healing of Bartimaeus is, I believe, particularly interesting because of the place it occupies in the ministry of Jesus Christ. It is the last recorded healing in Mark. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. When Jesus was at Jericho, he was about 15 miles from his goal. The period of his ministry, where the healing miracles had been prominent feature, had indeed come to a close. Jesus' face was turned to the cross. This healing then was all the more noteworthy. It was a roadside ministry which could make no difference to the great end that he had in view. Compared to the panorama of events which were about to unfold in Jerusalem, it was nothing, nothing but a person in need. Nothing but a work of mercy and love to be done. And Jesus did it. It is the meanwhile mercy, the roadside ministries, that we are all so apt to omit. We are so absorbed in a task and the deeds of helpfulness which have no relation to it, which contribute nothing to forward it, indeed seem very trivial. One who has a great aim in life to which they are giving their heart and their strength and mind, can all too readily excuse themselves from time-consuming detours that only slow them up in reaching the goal. I am sure there is sometimes a disdain for meanwhile ministries, even on the part of those who say that they are working for the reorganisation of society. Acts of mercy and charity tend to become only palliatives. They contribute nothing to the new social structure. The individual need is lost sight of in the glow of the far-shining horizon. But Jesus did not reason that way. One more blind man healed would make no difference to the great culmination of his ministry and life but it would be one more blind man healed. A work of love was never a small thing to him who looked on people with the very compassion of God. The answer to any argument that service of any sort is only a drop in a bucket is that it is only a drop in a bucket and Jesus puts a high rating on drops in a bucket. In the realms of celestial accounting, 
drops in a bucket and cold cups of water are big business. Matthew himself tells us, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. Amen.